uh, for coming along today. And an important event today and an issue of huge importance uh, to Ireland, uh, the protection of civilians and UN uh, transitions. Just one or two words of uh, housekeeping um, at the beginning, just to say to everybody, it is of course a, um, a, a public uh, event and uh, we have quite a sizable audience uh, participating uh, online. The number of our speakers will be participating on, online as well. Could well be some uh, social media uh, um, uh, commentary uh, inevitably. And ju just to mention that in our audio system, it's quite sensitive to uh, comments being, being picked up in the room. So that's just purely at a, at a uh, housekeeping element at the beginning. <laughs> um, but at the very start, I'd uh, particularly like to acknowledge the important role in bringing today's event uh, together played by our uh, co-sponsors and just to to run through them and it's it's an impressive list of 13 co-sponsors UNHCR Global Protection Cluster Bangladesh Brazil Ireland DPO Netherlands Center for Civilian Civilians in Conflict Nonviolent Peace Force Norwegian Refugee Council NORCAP uh, Save the Children OCHA UNHCR UN, uh, the UN Office of the UN Human Rights, UNMAS, and the World Food Programme. So many thanks indeed for, for your contribution. As we mark Protection of Civilians Week, I think it's essential that we consider in practical terms the question of how we step up and step in during and following a UN transition or withdrawal. And in September of 2021, during our recent presidency of the UN Security Council, Ireland led the drafting and adoption of the very first UN Security Council resolution on UN transitions. That was resolution 2594. And there are many dimensions of this resolution that Ireland was delighted to advance. And these include setting out definition for what we mean by transitions for the first time, this helps to build a shared understanding of the issues we need to address. A number of strong gender provisions, the importance of prioritized sequence mandates, and the role of the Peace Building Commission. But there are two dimensions of which I have particular pride. And the first is its focus on protection of civilians. How this must be nationally owned and inclusive involving all segments of society, including women and young people. And I'm really delighted today that we're joined by experts from New York, civil society and mission settings, from whom we can learn more on how to put this into practice and how protection actors can continue to support the protection of civilians during and after transitions and withdrawals. And the second dimension is the support of this resolution, support this resolution got from the UN membership. 97 member states who sponsored this resolution. We are very glad that, that included all UNSC uh, members at the time. This widespread support demonstrates the importance of the issue across the UN membership. And I think the shared recognition of the need to get this critical phase right if we were to build on the hard won gains of peacekeepers. And today it's obvious, I think, to us all that the resolution and its implementation is ever more critical as we see dynamically changing conflict. We have environments in which UN, uh, difficult environments in which UN peacekeeping missions are operating, just to mention a few, DRC, Mali, Sudan, and the Central <laughs> Republic. And Ireland recognizes and welcomes the significant efforts that have been made to prioritize and support protection and we need to continue to learn from those actions and ensure protection capacities to optimize future transitions. It's also important that host nations are better equipped to consolidate peacekeeping and peacebuilding gains, including prioritizing protection. And a crucial element to supporting this cooperation with key national, regional, and international protection actors, communities. And I look forward to listening to the perspectives and experiences of a diverse range of experts, protection leaders, who will share their perspectives and insights from the field. I'm also very interested to hear how Resolution 2594 can be further operationalized by the UN, civil society actors, and member states. 
taking account of the changing circumstances that we're all witnessing and how we can continue to support the protection actors to facilitate effective UN transitions and withdrawals. Finally, a big thank you to our facilitator, Marlies Spool from OCHA, our panelists, and to all the colleagues at UNHCR and Global Protection Cluster who planned this event today. Marlies, if I might leave, leave us in your very capable hands now to kick off discussions on this very important topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you to the Permanent Mission of Ireland for supporting this event. Um, the discussion today really aims to shed light on the impacts and implications of UN transitions and mission withdrawals on the protection of civilians in different contexts, and importantly, to look at what actions can be taken uh, to take forward protection during these changes and to build upon that collectively so that we can better support uh, the protection of civilians. We have a great assortment of protection leaders and allies today from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Mali and Sudan, very different contexts, very different types of transitions or withdrawals, but each bringing particular challenges, um, but also hopefully insights for us as we try collectively to ensure that we're doing the best possible uh, effort to support protection of civilians. I will introduce our panelists. Uh, we have the, the privilege of having uh, Mr. Bruno Limarki as our keynote speaker joining us from Kinshasa. Bruno is special representative of the Secretary General, uh, you, resident and humanitarian coordinator. It's quite a mouthful for, uh, and, and a very pivotal uh, role in transitions, who is joining us from uh, Kinshasa. Bruno joined the UN in 1992 and uh, also previously served as DSRSG in Haiti. Uh, also extensive experience with UNDP, including as Deputy Director in the Crisis Bureau uh, and in field missions uh, in Somalia, in uh, occupied Palestinian territories, Cambodia and Ethiopia. Welcome. We're also joined online from Goma. From, uh, by Cynthia Jones, who is Emergency Coordinator for Eastern DRC with the World Food Program. Uh, she's worked with WFP for over 28 years across four continents, uh, responding to emergencies in many, uh, many different types of emergencies, whether that be the Ebola response or earthquake response, um, and joins us today. We also have with us in the room uh, Mohamed Touré, who is the UNHCR representative in Mali, and he has been in that post for a number of years now uh, as a strong advocate for the rights of refugees and IDPs uh, throughout his career, uh, including in positions uh, in CAR, in DRC, and also in Iraq. I'm also thrilled that we're joined by Nimat Akhmadi, founder and president of the Darfur Women Action Group, which is a women-led anti-atrocities non-profit organization that aims to amplify the voices of and empower uh, communities. Nimad is a native of North, North Darfur and a global advocate and one who has been recognized by the United States uh, with a Human Rights Defender Award. We also have joining us uh, online Matilda Vu, advocacy ma manager with the Norwegian Refugee Council in Sudan, where she served for the past three years, previously in Khartoum, now in Port Sudan and, and Nairobi. And she has worked on advocacy for humanitarian organizations over the past 10 years uh, in Afghanistan, Jordan, Nigeria, and of course, Sudan. So I'm very pleased to bring together this diverse range of perspectives to discuss uh, the protection of civilians in these transitions. And if I may, I will hand over to you, Bruno, as, as the triple hat, who is, at, of course, at the center of a lot of these planning efforts. And if you could share with us your reflections on how the UN, together with the government of DRC, is approaching the protection of civilians as part of the disengagement process and the broader transition, and 
your reflections on that. Over to you, Bruno. Do we have connectivity for Bruno? Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Greetings, everybody from Kinshasa. Uh, I'm very pleased to join you today. Thanks to the organizers, the Permanent Mission of Ireland, UNHCR, the Protection Cluster, and others. Thank you. Just to start, for those who know just a little about the DRC, just to say that it's a gigantic country that is full of potential, full of, of opportunity, that is a solution country to some of the world's global problem of climate change and energy transition. Uh, and it's not only a country in crisis, with conflict, with humanitarian situation, with displacement. So just to say that always important to be nuanced when we talk about some of those countries. This being said, this discussion takes place in a, during a, a, at a critical juncture in, in, a, in the DRC in a context of great, great, great complexity. So while MONUSCO is withdrawing, MONUSCO is the, the largest peacekeeping mission now, uh, while it's withdrawing after more than 20 years of presence, because it started in 1999, the, at the same time the country's security landscape, landscape is deteriorating sharply over the past two years, uh, especially in Eastern DRC, and this is mainly due to the ongoing fighting with uh, a group called the M23, that uh, resurfaced two years ago in North Kivu. Also, the uh, increased attack by the ADF, which is a, a foreign armed group that has pledged allegiance to the uh, Islamic State, and also violent intercommunity conflicts, especially in Ituri. This is all happening in a context of uh, tense political, uh, high political tension in the region, especially <clears throat> between the DRC and, and, uh, and Rwanda. And so the situation weakens all the, the ongoing peace efforts, peace processes that, are, uh, uh, that have largely uh, stalled. So currently all efforts should be really made on peace, peace efforts uh, uh, to reduce the risk of a wider regional uh, conflict and ensure that all party works <coughs> towards de-escalation of tension. Those dynamics are, are uh, uh, compounded by a dire humanitarian situation. And the crisis in the Congo is one of the most complex, one of the most severe, one of the most protracted. It's a 30-year crisis now, one of the most neglected. And now I always say one of the most tolerated crises, humanitarian crisis in, in the world, uh, with large-scale internal displacement. We just passed the 7 million uh, uh, IDP figure, we are at 7.2, the second largest of the Sudan. So it's in that complex uh, context that the, the MONUSCO disengagement is unfolding. Just to say that the disengagement of MONUSCO has been going on for many years, because at some point the mission was uh, present all over the country, but now we are talking about the final leg of that disengagement from the most conflict-affected provinces of Ituri, North Kivu, and South Kivu. So where does this come from? It comes from a request from the DRC government, uh, and after which, so recently, in, uh, in September, this uh, request was brought to the Security Council in, in September after many, many, many uh, discussions uh, in the Council. Uh, after that request was received, the Council uh, uh, opened the door to discussion about this final disengagement, and MONUSCO and the government worked on and signed a disengagement plan in November 2023 last year. This plan outlines the practical modalities of the gradual transfer of tasks, uh, responsibility and tasks from MONUSCO to the government uh, for a responsible and orderly withdrawal. So we are not in a, a Mali context. We are in an orderly and uh, responsible withdrawal scenario. The plan comprises three different and uh, distinct and successive phases of this engagement, one for each province, uh, beginning with the departure from Monusco, uh, of MONUSCO from South Kivu by the end of June, but the mandate of MONUSCO has already ended on the 30th of April, uh, uh, one month ago. There is no end date for the final disengagement 
uh, it's a discussion that will happen phase after phase, including with the with the government and with the Security Council. In turn, this uh, this engagement was uh, 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 recognized. Uh, the, the Council took full full note of it in the most recent mandate renewal of MONUSCO resolution 2017. So the, that disengagement is ongoing and it's going hand in hand with a, an orderly transition. To pave the way for the transition, we have worked on what we call here successor arrangement. That means to, this is a, a conversation to inform the transfer of tasks between Monus, from MONUSCO to the government with support whenever needed, whenever required from partners, first and foremost, the UN agencies, but also other partners, bilateral, multilateral partners, INGOs, civil society, local organizations. The priorities of the transition are the priorities of the MONUSCO mandate that will, uh, that, uh, that will be uh, handed over with transfer of tasks, protection of civilian, which was the DNA of MONUSCO, security, human rights, strengthening of state authority <laughs> and the disarmament, demobilization, community reintegration of ex-combatants. Uh, part of the transition discussion has also been to advance uh, this uh, conversation to shape a comprehensive approach to, uh, to ensure continuity of the protection of civilians in a post-MONUSCO uh, environment. As MONUSCO is withdrawing, there are uh, significant protection risks in particular, the security of civilian, IDPs, and communities at risk. Because MONUSCO has been pivotal over many years in securing, uh, in reducing security threats, uh, in mediating, facilitating dialogue between communities, and the primary responsibility will now shift to the Congolese uh, authorities, especially the Congolese secu security forces. One of the uh, main concerns is also the fact that currently there are many uh, uh, security actors, armed actors, that operate in Eastern DRC, uh, and coordination among those many uh, forces presents challenges for civilian protection and humanitarian access. Another con concern uh, is the fact that, that violation of international humanitarian law and human rights remain alarmingly extensive, in particular sexual violence. And as the mission withdraws, the risk of expansion of armed group, as well as the continuous recruitment of uh, youth and children might exacerbate the situation. Furthermore, MONUSCO withdrawal will also have an impact on the UN protection capacity in terms of human rights monitoring, documenting, and public reporting child protection and women's protection, because you, MONUSCO was well equipped, well equipped uh, to deal with, uh, with those issues. Of course, OHGHR will remain, but it's an issue of the capacity that will remain behind. Yeah. So let us reflect now on the responses to this protection risk to ensure continuity of protection during those disengagement and transition phases. So a couple of points. First, over the past decades, decades, MONUSCO has been working with communities to establish a lot of local system uh, lo uh, using two developing tools for the purpose of uh, protecting civilians, such as local protection communities, community alert networks, and so on. A critical part of the transition will entail supporting the capacity of the assigned Congolese entities uh, to ensure the continued effectiveness of those uh, community-based mechanisms. And in this context, there is significant potential for unarmed, civilian-centered approaches to protection. Second, as I said, the DRC government has expressed its commitment to fully assume its responsibility in protecting civilians, uh, and it needs to be supported in doing so. It's not an easy task. So to address the protection vacuum left by MONUSCO, a functional and well-trained, well-resourced uh, Congolese army and police uh, are needed, but also an operational framework to support the DRC government's leadership uh, in the protection of civilians together with the affected communities. We are having a lot of discussion uh, between with the authorities, the UN family, MONUSCO, and many UN agencies, UNHCR, UNDP, IOM, uh, UNFPA, 
OHGHR, as well as many partners, INGO, civil society included, to shape this post monusco POC uh, approach and uh, effective cooperation among all those actors in support of this new approach, this new operational framework will be key, including to leverage the resources, the capacity all those partners will bring in a coherent fashion. Uh, and third, the robust protection responses will be required from international partners and civil society uh, in coherence with the operational framework I've, uh, I've mentioned. And this will require support from all sides, humanitarian actors, development, peace actors, and also uh, donor support. More broadly, I want to add that uh, just as part of this uh, broader context, the, the, the complexity of the crisis in the DRC, in brief, because I can speak about that for a long time, there are three pockets of solution to the crisis as a whole. First is political solution and the primacy of politics also, uh, of course, including regional solution. Second is to really advance, uh, and many I'm sure who are listening are uh, 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 a player in this, to advance the operationalization of the nexus and durable solution at scale. So peace, development, humanitarian actors, we need to work at scale. We need to work with the government at the center to advance and find uh, in the search also for durable solution. We need much more, many more investment in peace, in development, in stabilization in Eastern DRC to reduce civilian exposure uh, to violence and to reduce the dependency on humanitarian aid. And finally, it's not possible to talk about protected environment in the DRC without mentioning the imperative to tackle the underlying drivers of conflict especially land, especially the exploitation of natural resources, such as conflict minerals, and also the issue of illicit financial flows. To end, you ask whether we can draw lessons in strengthening the continuity of protection in a context of transition. So although our process is still unfolding, I thought about it and then uh, came with three, three lessons that uh, we can draw already. The first one is that, uh, of course, we always say that, but transition, the transition conversation must begin as early as possible during the life of a mission to work out and consolidate those successor arrangements uh, with a view to ensure ownership and sustainability. POC is the, D the DNA of MONUSCO. POC is the DNA of many uh, uh, peace operations but it's largely a peacekeeping concept and a peacekeeping <laughs> approach that cannot be replaced as such. So it's very, very important to work on the post-mission approach uh, on, on, uh, on protection, to build capacity, to build system way, way, way in advance with national actors, with communities, with civil society actors, with INGOs and so on. And this is not, not happening naturally. It's not happening naturally. And as we know, all the habits they are. The second lesson, as we all know, especially in New York, there is nothing automatic in a transition being funded. Uh, the mission goes, the budget goes. It's as simple as that. And then we enter into the world of voluntary contribution. So designing, uh, working way in advance, designing a comprehensive funding strategy and engaging member states partners, IFIs, but also the national government uh, is also key, and we should do that from the outset. Uh, just to say we are very grateful to the Peace Building Fund, who are, uh, they are really helping in our context of transition, and this is very precious money. We call it the precious money uh, during the transition phase. And uh, last word, the third lesson. I have not mentioned, because it's not the topic, but just to say uh, the potential consequences on, of MONUSCO withdrawal on the humanitarian situation and humanitarian access. The mission MONUSCO was providing substantial support to the humanitarian operation, in particular in terms of logistics and security. But when a mission leaves, we have to be ready. We have to prepare, we have to adjust, we have to adapt, we have to be ready and not lament. It's about preparing, not lamenting. So here I use the word detox a lot with partners. You have to detox, you have to get ready. 
I was told detox is too harsh, so now I, I, have, I was told to use weaning. So <laughs> it's the weaning process. We have to prepare ourselves to operate in a context without a mission, like many of our colleagues do in Northeast Nigeria, in Yemen, in many countries, there is no peace mission. Uh, so we have to prepare despite all the challenges we are facing and will be facing in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno, for pointing out some of the critical elements to the current process and also lessons for future processes. I'd like to turn now to Cynthia. If you could briefly highlight some of the uh, impact that you see in terms of protection, in terms of food security, and uh, we, as we know, this is happening against a quite a volatile uh, backdrop. Over to you, Cynthia. Uh, greetings uh, to you all from Goma. Can you hear me okay? Indeed. Okay, great. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the Irish Mission for hosting this and the co-sponsors. And thank you to uh, all, of the, all of the partners of, her, of, her, of uh, protection of civilians that are in the room there. And thanks for joining us today. Um, and yeah, uh, firstly, just all credit to uh, the, the Deputy uh, uh, Special Representative of the SRSG's leadership and in driving the transition planning, um, you know, with the government and the UN um, agency funds and programs under very uh, challenging circumstances, um, as you've heard, and, um, and also for his excellent uh, presentation, which pretty, pretty much covers the, you know, the, you know, the big, um, you know, the, I guess, the challenges and implications. Um, and, and from my side, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to kind of bring maybe a, a what I would call like a ground zero uh, uh, view. And as you said, looking at it from, you know, humanitarian operations and um, the food insecurity uh, uh, perspective. Um, as Bruno highlighted, um, you know, the transition is um, happening um, you know, amongst the um, intensification of conflicts. Uh, and I think, you know, we have to talk about the power vacuums, um, you know, in the other areas that um, is happening as a result of um, a focus on, you know, the conflict in North uh, Kivu. Um, and we are seeing um, increased uh, protection risk, not just for civilians, but for humanitarian workers. Um, and one example is the is really the heavy artillery that is being used in and around um, the camps in Goma, which has, you know, this year alone resulted in 38 uh, deaths and 74 um, injuries. Um, and also the you know, Bruno has uh, mentioned that the, you know we've reached 7.2 million and uh, uh, people, and um, I just want to highlight that this uh, the forced displacement continues uh, um, almost unchecked, and this of course disrupts the livelihoods, uh, local food systems, uh, market access, uh, market prices, and access to food for the displaced populations. So. You know, in and around Goma, we've got about 700,000 um, IDPs that are currently um, under the protection of, um, you know, <laughs> that MINUSCO is defending. Um, and numerous other uh, hundreds of other thousands of IDPs that are still seeking shelter around uh, um, MINUSCO bases. <clears throat> um, so all of this is just exacerbating already a dire food security situation with 5.5 million uh, people just in those three eastern provinces, you know, in crisis and emergency levels of food insecurity. And this is data from last year and data from uh, prior to the breakdown of the ceasefire and prior to all of these waves and uh, waves of um, displacement that has um, happened. 
And um, related to, you know, protection, um, access to food and food security um, is a protection outcome. Uh, um, without food, uh, uh, you know, there is limited um, protection. And I think in the context of, uh, uh, you know, where we are, where folks are, you know, really um, unable to return home in camps and have limited uh, livelihood um, opportunities, that there is a need for this predictable uh, um, food assistance to, you know, be able to mitigate some of the protection outcomes that um, occur with women having to go and, uh, oh, can you hear me? Yes, oh. I can. Um, oh, I, oh, I lost you for I a while. I can ask you to, to sum yeah. up. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Cynthia. And so, so basically, I the other point that I just wanted to, so again, so of course, we have a lot of concerns about, you know, from a humanitarian perspective on, uh, you know, on the situation. Um, as... Uh, you know, as Bruno highlighted, of course, the mission comes with a lot of um, a lot of capacity, uh, um, and the one that he highlighted was this uh, um, logistics capacity and opening up access. So, all in this context, um, we have done. Uh, you know, there has been a contingency plan done. Uh, you know, to deal with what what we think is a, you know, a, a pretty reasonable probability that um, there's going, could be up to 340 to 570,000 newly displaced persons um, in um, um, South Kivu. And, uh, you know, we will see, um, you know, beyond the capacity drop, you know, we will have insecurity worsen with um, increased criminality, uh, um, you know, with the job loss. And I, I want to highlight that one cannot underestimate the physical um, access constraints, you know, in a context where there are no roads, uh, broken bridges, uh, think, uh, things get uh, very flooded. Um, and also now in South Kivu, we've had extensive flooding, further displacement, um, increased uh, food insecurity and a further destruction of the uh, of the um, you know of infrastructure and that also thank you Cynthia yeah oh thank you for sharing your thoughts and, and explaining a bit the complexity of the situation there and and what we need to to plan for I'd like to hand over now to to Mohammed who uh, is bringing the experience of Mali, where of course we had a very different type of change in the situation. And I wanted to, to hear from you what have been some of the impacts and some of the challenges and how the system has tried to respond to that. Over to you, Mohamed. Actually, it's funny, I was listening to Tinsha and Bruno, I was thinking to myself, I, I, I wish I could have spoken before then. And to let them speak up to me would have exactly tell you where we are now six months after having been asked to leave. Uh, uh, I mean, the mission has been asked to, 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 to leave. Uh, first, I would like to thank you, to thank you uh, Ambassador, for hosting this event. And I'm uh, quite happy to come all the way from the field just to share with you my, my experience. Uh, as one of the first missions which has been asked to leave recently, and fortunately, it started to be a trend now. After Mali, I think the UNESCO has, been, uh, UNESCO has been asked to leave the country. The same thing is happening in Somalia, the same thing in Iraq, Sudan. So in a way, there is a trend of having those mission leaving. So we will be having kind of uh, advance in terms of giving maybe some advice or some kind of uh, uh, advocacy with regard to how we can carry on that. I would like first to also thank the, the uh, host sponsor of this, uh, of this event, which I really am very, very grateful for that. Uh, I think the, what I have to say, likewise, Sudan, DRC, and uh, Mali has really facing, I would say, a multifaceted crisis. I mean, it could be a political one, economical, uh, financial, and maybe humanitarian protection crisis. That is what we are really facing right now in Mali. Uh, by establishing 
to the uh, 90, 95-94 uh, resolution of the Security Council to strongly impose on the security of the, the protection of the civilian. Masli has been really going to fight challenging, challenging situation. Minister and uh, the rest of the humanitarian community, I mean, mainly I'm talking about the UN and the NGOs, etc., dealing with the humanitarian aspect in Mali, has been really uh, an example to be followed. Has been an example to be followed because they've had a kind of collaborative approach in which we are all geared in trying to secure and to see how we can maybe uh, protect and increase the protection of the civilians. But unfortunately, the sudden departure of Minister, I mean, uh, unlike uh, Sudan and unlike uh, DRC, Mali Rotary had been given six months to leave. I mean, it was just a resolution and it was unexpected. When I say unexpected, we were not really prepared as a UN country, we were not really prepared as a United Nations to take off without any kind of uh, consultation, etc. We were just given kind of uh, like a person and uh, a uh, to the to the EU if you have six months to leave, I mean, even the manager was talking about three months instead of six months. So, you know, it was really sudden and it was quite brutal. Uh, the way that the Minister had left, it was something that we really deplore. Uh, many of the bases were invited by the population because the people were just starving and they were just looting all the, the material and the equipment in those bases. So, you know, it was something that was not already made. Unfortunately, that was the case. Uh, so when we were looking back for that, and the time given to us for that was extremely, extremely short. Extremely short, and we were not really clear about that. So now we have to, to open a new book in which we have to innovate, innovate and see how we can open it. Uh, without first, we don't have the legal backing of the Security Council resolution. I mean, Minisma was strongly there, and Minisma is just like the elephant in the room. And when they were there, we were not all the, the rest of the humanitarian actors or the were totally invested. We have a big elephant in the room, and all the small animals uh, were not really uh, visible by the rest of the community. And whatever we could have done was not really perceived as something very substantial in terms of protecting the, the population. But one thing we should have done now we are left with is uh, how we can open a new paragraph or a new chapter of what we will be dealing with uh, uh, handling the batteries out of it's just a protection without any arm. We are, the Minisma has something like 18,000 uh, persons who are there, including many human rights uh, activists, many human rights, uh, I would say, persons. Close to 100, 100 persons, mainly including the, the High Commission for Human Rights uh, branch, which is extremely strong in being uh, able to cover the whole country. But now when we have this Minisma, the only consequence, even with regard to the humanitarian space, it's really true, true in the world that uh, there are many regions of the Mali today is not totally, you cannot open it because it's a military zone, it's an uh, incomplete zone in, in those regions, so we don't have the, the security, uh, I would say, equipment to deal with this thing. So that we, we are really sure to the, the emergency, the United space is extremely somehow uh, detrimental there. And there is a vacuum left by uh, the departure of the Minisma. The vacuum is simply, but it's vacuum in terms of logistics. There are many places where we cannot go any longer because we don't have the possibility to have a, a plane landing there. We don't have the, the, the I will say, the, the, the security provided to the, to the actors, the military actors trying to provide that. And of course, beyond the, the actors, they are leading, the displacement is really increasing. It's increasing because many of the, the population find extremely safe to be close to a municipal base where they, 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 they were somehow given kind of assistance and protection. Uh, or maybe, maybe that tends just to, to, to salute the fact that the human groups include the Bangladesh troops everywhere, very close to the population, not necessarily in terms of uh, having a security term of it's this kind of soft power that. Uh, the troops were able to bring into the population was really something in added value by having a, 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 a population, having really this kind of closeness to the population, kind of soft power that uh, many troops like the Bangladesh one were extremely helpful for that. The all of that's gone with the departure of Uh Of course, to the response as well that, that your agency and others have also mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Of course, yeah. No, no, uh, I was trying just to set the ground and then we can just to move on to what are the, uh, as I said earlier, I think we were not prepared, prepared in a way that we were just given a kind of short notice in order to be able to, to respond to that. What we are trying to do now is just to see how we can possibly promote accountability. Uh, promote accountability in, in, in a region where we don't have, as I said earlier, the Syrian Security Council back backup and it are having a kind of uh, a backing of the security council in Mahali. So to talk about accountability means authorities are not willing to accept that kind of uh, uh that we don't like that. We have to we don't have to forget that the one Muslim started to be very really vocal about human rights violations when they were first to leave the country. So today this role has to be played by different actors which are not really somehow equipped to respond to this uh, in, in, in a in a in a in a, in a in an orderly manner. So we have also to enhance the civilian uh, cooperation. I mean, the civilian military cooperation, that is something that we are trying to, to see how that can be put in place, implemented. And of course, this is not the rest of the authorities we really are facing a uh, kind of problem with that. Uh, engaging partners, different partners, particularly the civil society, uh, which are not extremely strong, because today in Mali, I have to admit that the this kind of tendency to 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 to, to I mean, not have anybody voice their concern is a human rights violation. So in a way, it's a, it's a very taboo to talk about human rights violation. But in the meantime, we as a cluster, as a uh, global cluster, we have to find out ways to emphasize and to hold our voice with regard to this concern, which is really increasing. Unfortunately, since the departure of Minister over the last six months, we have almost 80 percent increase of human rights violations, including extrajudicial killing, including the collateral damages. I mean, it's called collateral damages because the drone doesn't have the, the intelligence to distinguish which is which is civilian and which is uh, armed people. So, you know, it's really severely increasing, and we have to make this kind of advocacy with regard to that. Uh, of course, coaching the dialogue with uh, non state actors. Uh, because in many regions, as I said earlier, we don't have the state operating in those regions. So we have to deal with uh, our media, who are the factors, the authorities, that we have to deal with them in order to be sure that the protection can be given to, to those people. Uh, I think it's maybe I can keep going and talking about that. But it just made one, one point, just more a personal reflection on the fact that uh, accountability is really key. It's key to what's going on right now in the region. It's not necessarily in Mali, but all over anyone have a contribution. The golden age, if I can call it like that, we saw so many tribunals where uh, in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Yugoslavia, where we have people who even including the head of state who were arrested and were brought before a tribunal in order to respond to the crime that they have committed. But unfortunately, nowadays, the country has been extremely politicized. Politicized in don't find many, many actors who will be able to, 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 to bring those issues at this kind of silence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your, your friends, and you don't, you don't really denounce that, and in a way, this kind of uh, fragmentation of what should be with the United uh, uh, Actors vis-a-vis -vis accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohamed. I'll turn now to Matilda, who is joining us from the Sudan, which is a context which, of course, has seen two uh, transition in recent years, both UNAMID and most recently UNITAMS, also quite abrupt. And if you could share with us some of the experiences uh, in terms of the ability of protection actors to respond, some of the challenges, and, and how you're trying to adapt. Over to you, Matilda. Sure. Um, thank you very much, Marlene, and, and thanks for having me in, uh, in this panel today. Um, actually, you know, Sudan is being discussed right now at the UN Security Council on this exact topic uh, because it's been 13 months of uninterrupted, horrific violence, really an all-out war in the middle of homes, a, a war against civilians, I have to say, that has destroyed the capital, that destroyed hundreds of villages and towns, that has conducted also large scale, large scale killing that Human Rights Watch has actually defined as ethnic cleansing. And right now there's a new potential of mass atrocity unfolding right now in, in North Darfur. 
right. So I, I guess that gives you a hint of the message that I want to pass today mm -hmm. is that right now the absence of protection for civilians in Sudan has never been so so blatant. And sadly, when it comes to transition, I have to say that Sudan is a typical example where POC was being deprioritized when the international com community transitioned out of UNAMID, the gigantic peacekeeping mission, to UNITAMS, the fragile special political mission, to today, where there is nothing. So already before the war, the protection of civilian on file was quite deprioritized. UNITAM was very much focused on the political transition in Khartoum, which was quite important. But the POC file was quite disinvested. It didn't have resources, it didn't have political capital, and it didn't have the right people uh, in the field. With the war, the protection of civilian pillar ended, and obviously UNITAMS itself was terminated. And to be fair, by design, the protection of civilian pillar of UNITAMS could not have survived the conflict because it was built on a assumption, a fundamental assumption that the authorities would actually uphold their responsibility to protect. And they did not. And worse than that, they were the perpetrators and they have been the perpetrators of all the violations. So currently what we have is that we have a Secretary General Personal Envoy who focus mostly on the peace and mediation process, which is quite important as well. Yes. Some of our UNITAM's key protection of Syrian activities, such as the monitoring of violation, have been transferred to OECHR. Sadly, the permanent ceasefire committee, that was uh, something that UNITAM's was progressively building and quite efficiently building across Darfur, uh, was not handed over. And so essentially right now, there's no leadership, no one holds the fire of protection of civilian in Sudan. And so in this vacuum, humanitarian organizations have tried to step up. So organizations like mine, as part of the humanitarian mandate, are really fighting to remain and you know, to deliver in conflict-affected areas like Darfur, to provide assistance, sometimes protection assistance, and I guess very limited protection by presence. But we're facing immense challenges, especially because there's blatant obstruction of humanitarian access conducted by warring parties. The most remarkable examples of protection actually comes from the local responders. You might have heard of them. We call them the emergency rooms. These are Sudanese, absolutely brave Sudanese volunteers who stepped <clears> up, <throat> who are still living on the front line and who are providing life-saving assistance. And sometimes this assistance includes protection of civilian activities like evacuation. As a protection sector, we've conducted some protection of civilian advocacy. We've briefed you know, special mandate holders. We've briefed uh, the Human Rights Fact Finding Mission, the informal expert group on POC. But, but my, my point is that all this is not enough. The civilian pr protection file cannot be solely held by the protection sector and by humanitarian agencies. Because POC is inherently political. And while us humanitarians, we should do our part, we have to do it in, compl in complementary with political actors, which right now are not looking at this. At the political level, the focus of the international community has been largely on brokering a national level ceasefire. And I have to say that at the moment when we see the fighting that is raging in North Darfur and across the country, it seems a little bit at odds with the objectives of the warring parties. They seem very much focused on securing a military victory rather than coming to the table of discussion. But importantly, assuming that transformative protection of civilian efforts can wait for a national ceasefire is going to cost us thousands, thousands of lives, including tomorrow. So this needs to change. And our first recommendation as a humanitarian organization on the ground is that out of transition, we still need to have a dedicated protection of civilian mechanism that will bring leadership, that will bring resources, that will bring coordination with all the different efforts that are you know, happening on the ground and that will bring it under one strategy. And so how does it look like? Well, 
we don't have the answers and, and I'm not a POC expert and NRC is absolutely not a protection of Syrian uh, organization, but I guess as non-expert that gives us the luxury of being a little bit uncon unconventional or maybe unrealistic. Um, but I wanted to, to uh, propose something, suggest something. Um, what we've noticed is that over this past year, while the international community mostly turned a blind eye on, on Sudan, Sudanese have actually stepped in. And over the past years, there have been different example of fragile, but efficient, low profile local arrangements between warring parties, between traditional leaders. They were facilitated by civilians, by elder groups, and that have managed to contain violence. So for example, Al Fasha right now that is on the fire had a sort of local arrangement between the different warring parties and armed group that almost lasted nine months and that prevented from the city to be completely destroyed over these nine months. And there are other examples across the offer in the quarter fund that we should learn from. And so perhaps that's the type of protection of civilian mechanism, you know, that we should be looking at. Something that would be flexible, that would be mobile, and that would be supporting, consolidating, monitoring, <laughs> localizing, uh, localized arrangements. And that would be well supported by the international community. Um, it would have to create relationship with local commanders, with tribal leaders, with civilian groups. But in a context as fragmented as Sudan, perhaps this is where we need to find the solution at the local level rather than at the national level. And what it could look like is that it would help maintain a localized truth, for example, in one state or one locality, maybe another pause for a harvest season somewhere else, a regulation on checkpoint in another locality, or even removing weapons from the center of towns, you know, in another in another place. So basically the protection of Syrian mechanism that is low profile built on local initiatives that already exist and that would be informed by the local actors and their readiness for compromises rather than you know, imposing, for example, a, an international agenda of, of ceasefires. But most importantly, we think that it would bring some immediate protection of civilian outcome, which we don't have right now. So that's an <clears> option. <throat> there could be many more and there should be many more, but the problem is that at the moment, the conversation on protection of civilian is not happening except for today with you. And I'm thankful for that. So you, I don't want to take too much of the time. I'll conclude with one thing. Um, Transition for Sudan has meant lack of attention, and I hope that uh, it will be reversed because it's not too late. Over. And I think it, it highlights uh, very tragically what uh, the result is when the primary uh, responsibility for protection is not being upheld by parties. And you mentioned uh, the importance of local local efforts and local actors. And I want to turn now to you, Nimaz as a person who is supporting a grassroots intervention and to hear your thoughts on these these prophecies and on the situation over to you um thank you um i'll like to thank the national parliament for organizing this i think um uh, this event is timely as matilda mentioned that um the given the crisis in sudan and there's not much discussion about uh, civilian protection and so I'm pleased to be a part of this, uh, but I'm also overwhelmed and really devastated to uh, watch um, the situation that is um, currently, we are witnessing one of the worst in our lifetime humanitarian and civilian protection crisis unfolding in Sudan, and particularly in Darfur, a region with history of genocide, war crimes. Yeah. Crimes humanity, people who have been driven out of their homes 20 years ago, the remaining comes, but now uh, they are, God knows how many times they have been re victimized, have been attacked. And um, every hour uh, we are receiving information from a departure, there's no good news at all. Uh, there's mass extermination, there's attack on the most vulnerable. Eternal displays camp. Um, last night, uh, actual camp was torch. Um, several cluster of the camp to be burned. Civilians were wandering around because there's no place for them to go. And the situation in Al Fashion is one of the most dangerous. It echoes uh, the situation in Al Jinaina, but luckily, those who were able to flee at the very uh, critical risk of their own life from Al Jinaina 
they had um, a neighboring country where they can cross to. Then that's not the case in Al-Pashir. And Al-Pashir is not a self-sustained um, city. So though people can die of thirsty, hunger, and also are badly killed. And one of the most dangerous um, news that we heard um, uh, two days ago is that um, rebel support forces affiliate are urging their fighters to scorch the civilians. Clear, clear museum saying, clear the civilians on your way. That's the only way. Crush them, force them, either to flee or kill them. Burn the, the neighborhood in front of you. These are the information that is coming right now. We are witnessing one of them. <clears throat> that, um, it seems like a dream. Uh, so I think that speaks to what, what is the level of the civilian protection crisis that we're dealing with it in Sudan, uh, where the capital is completely being wiped out. The recent um, attack in central Sudan in Al Jazeera, when attacks in other areas, Khartoum, many NGOs speaking about uh, protection, there are certain levels of protection when there is no physical protection, but it's still. Aliens like yours, many of you who are here struggling, there are brave people who try to remain in Sudan when international diplomats, international community has walked away, but um, a few humanitarian agencies left there. Um, they created hope when they came to Mali and tried to offer it, only to see um, another devastation happening, and then these people were at risk themselves. Um, so, we, you can imagine uh, what um, the situation looks like right now for those. Um, additionally, another protection crisis that is being created and exacerbated by the world parties are uh, youth who are um, the first responder or uh, providing protection, as Matilda mentioned, the emergency rooms, uh, evacuating civilians, taking those who are worthy hospitals and feeding those in need are now at risk of being targeted by both sides. They are targeted for recruit. If they refuse to recruit with um, RSM, they are accused to be at least with staff. If they refuse to be recruited, and that is another danger that will limit provision of survival means that they continue to bring to provide for the last year. So it is really a devastating situation that requires from all of us to think when we talk about civilian protection, um, we understand civilian protection arises from obligation. And we do know too well that the obligation of the national government is to protect its people. But we don't have that right now in Sudan. There is no functional government or functional institution with the exception of the government in Port Sudan. And we saw the trend of the rebel support forces when they attack, they destroy institutions. And there are certain institutions that uh, represent protection element for our people, like hospitals. Yesterday, the only hospital in a fashion that we work really hard to support and make sure that it continues, including some international humanitarian organizations have been supporting was bombed. Um, children have been bombed, including in my hometown yesterday. Uh, they forced people to open schools when they open school only to see their children bombed. When people were fleeing away, yesterday was a very difficult situation. Um, my family and all people in the city, people usually run away when they see the plane. They were very bored of them because it bombed the school and every single person had a child in that school. Um, children ended up with um, their peers killed. So this is simply the uh, picture that uh, I'm trying to print to you of the, what the civilian protection crisis and humanitarian crisis that come with it in Sudan right now, with also other systemic way of the government in the northern part of Sudan is also promoting hate speech and rhetoric against um, those who are fleeing from other areas like Khartoum, Darfur, or going to the northern Sudan. So there is no safe place in Sudan right now. Um, I'm trying to be very brief, but Speaking about um, the situation in Sudan now and then uh, diving into the examples of civilian protection, 
and um, the you know, withdrawal of the enemy before this. So we do know during the transition that this is predictable. What is happening right now in Sudan, it is not new to probably many of you, and it was predictable why the deployment of the enemy was arise from the obligation of protecting civilians, because civilians were under attack by their own government and by um, the NGO militia that were created by the government. Um, during the long time of Yanami being on the ground, they provided, in many instances, there were success stories in which they saved lives when they provided patrol for women. Um, they were also protecting and providing protection element for humanitarian agencies to operate. Um, when the withdrawal came, I think that was the worst and the biggest mistake the Security Council has uh, made. Why? Because the element of the fact of which, for which the unit was there, were not removed. All the resolutions included the armament of the enemy. Of course, in 2019, the people of Sudan have forced the dictator out, but that was one individual. There wasn't any peace deal on the ground. There wasn't any transition. So people who were forced to leave, forced by whom? By the Janjaweed. At that time, the Janjaweed, we can see the warning sign and the indicator, because Janjaweed back then were on horses and camel back in Darfur. They were attacking villages. But by 2019, 2020, they were in the capital part of the presidential palace. They were promoted. So you can mind the danger. We have seen the trend between 2019 to 2020 when Yemen was drawn. How many attacks it was there for. It was very systematic. It was ethnically motivated. In Kendi 1, Kendi 2, Kendi 3, Al Jinaina, Jabal Moon, Kabir, Yasseri, all those cities where people were protesting attacks. And then the investment that was made for you. I think it was an opportunity that was missed. And there was going to be a success story if you want to say it through the transition. Because it shows that we know exactly what we are dealing with. But unfortunately, that did not happen. And it also signals to the perpetrator that it was okay now for them to continue to do because there wasn't any. Um, transition, there wasn't any uh, anything, any foundation in place. Um, and then when Yom was drawn, before that, we have seen the vulnerability, not only the people of Sudan, but also the humanitarian agencies. The famous attack and, and looting of WFP and Yom base in a budget was a lesson that we should have learned from. Unfortunately, it was not taken into consideration. Then we saw the coup and then after that, then, what, so unit dams came only already in a, in a situation that was volatile. The mission was not equipped because there was no political transition. The guys in Khartoum were not ready to transition to peaceful or stability in Sudan. They were working on destabilizing Sudan. So that's why, but even when the decision was made to withdraw or end unit dams, it was important to be present, there need to be a strategy in place whereby having UN presence is really important for agencies, for local actors who are working there, providing humanitarian response, and also providing protection measures. But that were not considered. It was immediately. And it was because it was forced by the government. UNM was also, we were told that it was the, uh, the, the interim government. I told them literally, I remember, that the interim government itself needs protection. Am I right? It didn't happen, unfortunately. What's hard for me when it comes to Sudan, we are saying everything that is going to happen, and we have to wait and watch until it happens. So, but I, I hope that when, once we can learn from experience and try to do things right, I think in other areas, there are, uh, as a colleague mentioned in DRC, you know, at least like when you have an elected government, there's not an ideal situation, but at least like there is a way you can deal, there is a framework in place to deal with this. Um, but and if there is no disarmament, there's no demobilization. So you can imagine um, that this is this was an inevitable 
um, speaking about protection as it relates to the situation of women. Sudan today is one of the worst places to be a woman. We have seen how uh, sexual and gender based violence being perpetrated against women. It was in Darfur 20 years ago. Many women who were attacked in Darfur were never being treated, um, counseled, healed until this started. And we have seen in Khartoum where women were abducted, um, sexual slavery incidents were reported and documented. And there is no um, infrastructure on the ground to provide protection for women, including women in society leaders. Uh, they are targeted because they are women, but also they are targeted because of their work. And we have seen ethnically motivated targeting in Antinena. When it comes to protection of women, um, let alone the physical protection that it's desperately needed right now in Sudan, is a safe space. Fortunately, there's no safe space in Sudan. We recently opened a women empowerment center, we call it, where women survivors are supposed to come in a very remote area, I'm going to disclose. But in the first day, we recorded 29 cases. That is the magnitude of how women are vulnerable and the level of attack on women. This was just in one day. But of course, by the time we are a month or two months, how many cases we have to report. With limited resources, with limited infrastructure, we are doing it with like south, like most of the diaspora community have been contributing to this. And then now uh, we are talking about um, lessons uh, that we 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 learn uh, from this situation. Um, it's really um, it is up to the international community and also the member state. Uh, I think the meeting today uh, on, on a financial hopefully it results in something tangible, but without with, with the situation that we see going on, there is not only going to be um, a civilian uh, protection crisis in Sudan, if it allowed to continue, it's going to be a regional protection crisis, uh, believe me or not, because the forces fighting in Sudan are coming from various countries uh, that are four forces. So what I'm um, trying to say, I will try to conclude that it is really important to raise the alarm to ensure that in when there is a um, crisis like this, it's not just about protecting the people, but also making it possible for protection agencies to operate, to do the job that they are. And we have to remind ourselves that if this is arise from obligation, so still there is an obligation to protect civilians, protect agencies. And I think the case of Sudan is a case of not only um, failure, but it's an abandonment. Uh, there are four were abandoned that then, but now Sudan is abandoned again. And I hope that this can change. And I'm hopeful, but um, I hope that every single one here online and here uh, speaking speak up and um, urge our leaders to ensure that we are not sitting by watching people being mass murdered. It's no place to go. Thank you. Thank you, Liman. Thank you very much. We'd like to take the opportunity to take some uh, questions and comments from the floor. We are short on time, so I would ask folks to be as brief as possible. Uh, we have some confirmed uh, requests to speak. I hand over now to Brazil. Thank you. I will be very brief. I just said it was very touching listening to you today. The challenges that we face in, in the transitions and withdrawals. And uh, I, I, I had a you prepared comments, but I, I just wanted to say that when we were on the council, I remember that we were uh, participating in an informal uh, uh, expert group for all protection civilians of the council, and we had a, an interaction in the, that group with a MONUSCO, <clears throat> and uh, we saw the, their concerns before uh, there was a change in the mandate and the transition there, and there was I remember there was this um, um, 
because they had a very good cooperation with the government of the party, the GRC, and the uh, and there was a concern, for example, of a topic that I covered during the time we were on the Council of Children in Armenian conflicts, that the MONUSCO was not in charge exactly of monitoring and reporting mechanisms on violations against children in Armenian <coughs> conflicts, but they provided the necessary safety and security for those people who went to difficult places to check the violations that take place. And uh, there was a concern uh, that we, they would lose the resources to do the job, report, and help uh, keep the children safe in the country. So my suggestion for colleagues who are, have the privilege to sit on the council, that when you negotiate with EOC mandates, the new York mandates, you pay attention that you have to ensure resources you have to give clear mandates for people in discussions with the <coughs> committee to ensure that there are resources for experts on human rights, uh, uh, child protection, uh, sexual and gender based violence, and that the withdrawals, uh, traumatic though they will be, are less traumatic than they need to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. We also have an intervention from the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this event, and uh, especially the very um, touching and, and uh, impressive uh, accounts from uh, different uh, 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 settings. Um, it makes it hard to, to add any, any comments to that, but, but let me just say that uh, the examples from uh, the DRC, from uh, Mali and uh, Sudan, also show yeah. that uh, community-led and locally-led initiatives can very much make, make a difference and deserve uh, support. Uh, also in our political uh, sphere where the protection of civilians and helping civilians uh, protect themselves uh, should be part of our uh, discussions. Um, I would like to ask the, the panelists uh, online and here uh, to maybe to reflect a little bit on how we can enhance support for these community-led uh, initiatives. Um, yeah, I'll leave it with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we also have an intervention from OUCHR. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by thanking our hosts for, for this uh, wonderful event. Um, since OHCHR was mentioned uh, uh, a number of times, I thought that it would be important to also to, to clarify um, the role that OHHR plays uh, both in transitions and after transitions. Um, I think that one of the, uh, the main caveats and that we've seen in seamless transitions over the past uh, few ones, and I thank you, Nima, for reminding us that Mali was not the initiation of this new trend of hasty uh, uh, transitions, but it was actually unilateral. It was called also to leave the country in the matter of, of a few months, uh, creating the vacuum of problems that you that you mentioned. Um, I thought it was important to to highlight that uh, when we have these missions, like in MONUSCO, uh, MINUSCA, UNMES, but also in SPMs, we do have human rights components that will leave most of the time as the missions leave, creating the type of, of vacuum that Mohammed referred to before. Uh, it's not that OHEHR will stay when the mission goes. There is, in many of these countries, no OHEHR successor presence. So the thinking that some uh, have, that if the mission leaves, this can be easily transferred to the country team, is a chimera. In some places, we do have OHHR presences. Uh, we do have a, an office, a joint office in uh, the DRC that will continue after uh, M MONUSCO leaves, albeit with a very weakened presence because as was mentioned before by Bruno, uh, the mission uh, provides the support for most of the staff that we have. Human rights uh, mandates are a poison pill <clears throat> for many of the, uh, the entities in the country team is something that you actually don't want to do because it actually creates many problems. I mean, Mohammed, you, you pointed exactly to, to that. And as we know, uh, when uh, missions leave in such, such a hasty manner in, in, in uh, Darfur, in Sudan, uh, in Mali, uh, we know that the situations have not been yet stabilized sufficiently to ensure that 
uh, there will be less violations. In fact, as you pointed out, violations increase. The problem is who is going to be doing the human rights monitoring and reporting that is so essential for the Security Council to be able to also have the information to take effective decisions. Uh, and let me end by, by being a bit provocative. Um, it's often argued that without uh, host uh, member consent, missions cannot stay, which of course it's, it's evident and it's true. Now, I think that there is a need to balance this need for a host state consent with the fundamental function of the Security Council to ensure the maintenance of peace and security. And I think that we need to think moving forward about how we can, we as the UN can assist member states in the Security Council to, to do that, that kind of thinking. What is it that is required when a host state uh, wants the UN to leave? We have now two upcoming uh, missions that will be probably uh, leaving, uh, uh, besides MONUSCO, and that is UNSOM in Somalia and UNAMI in, in Iran. So what can we do to ensure that there is a responsible transfer of tasks so that we don't go into the direction of uh, abandoning, in a way, uh, the functions of protections that, that, we, uh, that we have been doing and need to continue performing? Thank you. Thank you very much, Oscar. I see a hand, and I believe that is Katie. And then also we have a colleague from the UK mission. I would ask you to be brief, and I think we'll probably have to cap there. Over to you, Gay. Thank you. Gay Rosenblum Kumar from Nonviolent Peace Force. Uh, further to what Matilda was saying, and thanking her for advocating for local level protection. I want to add that NP still has a small protection force in El Fasher and Zamzam camp. This work started over two years ago when there was a transition from UNAMID to UNITAM, but it took a very long time to build it up, and it was too little too late. And similarly, as Bruno notes, in Eastern DRC, it took two years of advocacy, and only until recently, thanks to Bruno and SRSG Keita, that we're finally getting underway with more civilian-led protection, which we hope will help fill the vacuum of the transition. So I want to appeal to policymakers that this cannot be ad hoc and cannot be so late. And as Nimat said, it needs to be built into prevention and into long-term planning so that it is at gross roots and is there to do the work with locals before the transition happens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asma Ghazi Bouillon from the UK Mission, Naid on MINUSCA and MINUSCO. Uh, thank you for organising this. It's been really interesting to hear all the perspectives. I just want to pull on three main threads. One, I totally agree, preparation is key to transition. It should be baked in as the, at the outset of the mission. And I think a lot of the issues we are having is with um, partners not accepting that there will be a transition and possibly putting their heads in the sand and thinking it won't ever happen, it will happen. Um, it needs to be planned better. Man uh, expectations need to be managed. So unfortunately, when a mission leaves, its resources go with it. And as others have said, they don't transfer automatically to the country team. But you'd be amazed at how even host states um, think that this is the case, that they will have the peacekeeping budget without the peacekeeping operation. I think civilians also need to have, um, there needs to be specific and robust um, strategic communication plans with civilians, um, with local populations, particularly about trying to continue some of those initiatives that we've heard about today, local protection initiatives. And I think the other thing is, and it's particularly frustrating from uh, you know, a UK perspective, we do try to champion benchmarks in a transition, but there is no there is no overwhelming council support for it. And I think perhaps what needs to be done is uh, more work across the council with members to balance out hosting requests with the need for what a responsible transition should look like. And it's very difficult to do that without 
pleasure in it against some sort of benchmarks, but that is very unpopular politically to get through the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we need to conclude uh, our comments, but I think the importance both of, of planning, but of the situation on the ground and the responsibility of parties to conflict and government to ensure, because ultimately uh, that is where the most protection is coming from. I would like to hand over now uh, with uh, much gratitude to um, His Excellency Ambassador Mohammed Abdul Muhi from the Permanent Mission of Bangladesh to share some closing remarks and reflections with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, for asking me to say a few words. And Excellency, this is the first and dear colleagues, and I thank the Permanent Mission of Ireland for hosting us here today. And I also thank all the co-sponsors for organizing this important event to mark the protection of civilian, civilians week. Uh, my apology for being late, uh, like my other colleagues who are literally running between the meetings. So, but I have been briefed by my officers in the, in the discussions which has been going on here. And so far the discussion has been extremely useful and I appreciate the briefers for presenting the ground realities uh, in DRC, Mali, and Sudan in, in such an eloquent manner. It's a country that sends its men and women uh, to those difficult places to serve. I cannot overstate how sobering your accounts are for us. Colleagues, since the introduction in 1999 through Resolution 20, 1265, POC has become an integral part of the mandate of the peacekeeping operations. Today, 95% peacekeepers. 25% of these keepers are mandated to fulfill POC mandate in five missions. We believe these keepers have comparative advantage in protecting the civilians due to their ability to work with and support the national authorities in the host country. In addition to the regular patrol and military activities and ensure safe and secure movement of the civilians, the peacekeepers have also been undertaking operational civic activities such as medical treatment, supporting education, by providing stationary sanitizer, drinking water, etc. They are in many places constructing roads and bridges under quick impact projects. Our own peacekeepers have also earned reputation and trust by supporting the community through education, skills development, and by engaging them in, in, in sports and cultural activities, and also by building and supporting infrastructure and also in uh, engaging disaster management, for example, in a place like uh, South Sudan where I mean, the severe floods has become a natural phenomenon in the, in, in the, in the, in the recent years. Those works are facilitating, those works are facilitating social cohesion and, and preventing communal clashes and tensions of our daily needs. Although in the last 25 years, POC mandate has been strengthened in many ways in the recent years, many ways, in the recent years we have been witnessing some challenging some circumstances especially during the transition and after the withdrawal of the mission. We had to recently withdraw our personnel from Mali, Minusma, where the process turned out to be extremely difficult. Even for the peacekeepers themselves, the exit was not safe. And I would like to profoundly thank the USGO Kurukhari for making some arrangements for the uh, safe and secure uh, repatriation of our peacekeepers from the country. And I would like to specifically thank uh, the Ambassador Isa of uh, they are Mali, I don't know whether my brother is here or not, uh, whose interventions in some critical points, I mean, it was, it was extremely helpful in the safe evacuation of peacekeepers from Mali. However, the withdrawal has also created a vacuum in the overall POC mandate implementation by other actors, including the UN country team. Absence of peacekeeping missions limits the ability of various civilian protector actors in reaching out to the people in need. Excellencies and dear colleagues, after having reached an insightful discussions today, I would like to highlight a few points. First, primary responsibility of protecting the civilians goes to the host country. Therefore, to continue the work of the peacekeepers through a successful transition leading to sustainable peace, it is necessary to strengthen the capacity of the host governments. In its resolution 2594, the Security Council encouraged national governments to develop and implement comprehensive national plans, policies, and strategies 
to protect the civilians, which include national benchmarks in advance of peace operations transitions. The member states, even nations, entities, and other stakeholders, including the regional organizations, must assist the host government in fulfilling those obligations. Training and capacity building of national institutions are critical in this regard. And in this connection, the same view, same, same vein, I would like to refer to the resolution 2719. I believe that it's provided a very strong basis to promote the case of to, 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 to advance the robust policy regime, I'd, I'd rather say, in the conflict areas. Second, the Special Committee for Peacekeeping, C34, in its latest report, emphasized the importance of strengthening co coordination, coordination and coherence between peacekeeper, peacekeeping operations and the international entities in line with the respective mandates and strategies for protecting civilians in the cost, context of peacekeeping transitions. In this regard, it is critical to ensure early consideration of capacities, resources, and mandates that are required to leverage the role of the United Nations, political, humanitarian development tools, and the local and national levels, because the peacekeepers are needed to hand over the responsibilities with specificities to the relevant UN agencies and to the government entities. Third, financing has always been a critical factor to continue programs for the protection of the civilians after the departure of the peacekeeping missions. The partners need to find innovative ways to finance the POC projects, including the community engagement initiatives to support the efforts of the UN country team and other local actors. South-South cooperation can be a good option which can complement the traditional North-South cooperation in such situations. Investment from the peace building fund is also a tool to address the financing gap in transition contexts. Four, we have to also continue our awareness raising and education efforts. Peacekeeping missions often organize workshops and other community engagement programs in their respective areas. Those activities need to be replicated after the drawdown of the missions. The UN agencies and civil society actors may play a role here. They can involve the host government in such activities, observing POC Day in a calendar year as part of awareness raising program can be an option also. Today, even for, today's event, for example, is a, is a, is a good one. However, this needs to be done at the regional level as well. Finally, the hard truth, no effort will be enough to ensure protection of civilians if the political process in most countries is not followed through. We cannot give up the political solution to the challenges that many countries have been hosting peacekeeping operations face. It is our collective responsibility as a multilateral organization to achieve sustainable peace in all parts of the world. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. And that concludes our session. Yeah. 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 Yeah.